All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. We're super excited that you're here today, and we're super excited to have our plant biologist, Brandy Cannon, join us today. Um, so let's see. Any housekeeping? Um, as you know, Skype a Scientist is a nonprofit organization, and if you can support what we're doing, um, you, we'd really, really appreciate it. You can do that at patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist. We've got live streams going every week from now through April. And if you uh, have particular requests that people that you want to hear from, uh, subjects you want to hear about, talk about, just email us at skypeascientist at gmail.com. But without further ado, Brandy, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, how are you all? <laughs> We're doing great. We're really, really happy to have you here. Um, Already Mrs. Young's uh, fourth and fifth grade class say we were an acute an inquisitive crew of fourth and fifth graders here and ready to learn. So um, we're really glad you're here with us. Uh, I'm just gonna pretty much let you kick it off um, and uh, start sharing and we'll, we'll hear what you have to say. We can't wait to hear it. All right, thank you very much. Well, let me just share my screen here. Uh, hi, my name is Brandy Cannon. I'm an eighth grade science teacher and I'm the middle school science curriculum coordinator for my school. Uh, I'm also a scientist. <laughs> uh, I study plants. This is me in my garden uh, here uh, back home in Texas. I actually live in New York City and I work in New Jersey. So I actually commute every day to work. Um, first of all, I'd like to start with a happy Black History Month. Uh, as a Black scientist and a Black botanist, it's super important to me. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of information about who I am before you can start asking questions. All right, so the first thing I want you to know is that I study plants, but not just any plant. I study parasitic plants, and they happen to be my absolute favorite. So this one you've probably heard of is called mistletoe. You've probably never seen it before because sometimes uh, it's usually not where you're looking. So leafy mistletoe is usually found in trees, and what happens is birds eat their berries, um, and when they eat them, there's like this really sticky coating. If you've ever had a pomegranate before, it has that really sticky arrow on the outside of the berry of the fruit of the seeds. And what happens is that gets stuck on the bird's tail feathers. So because birds don't have toilet paper, um, they wipe their butts on branches, as you can see here. So that's how the seed gets started. So the seed actually, uh, it starts there. And then what happens is because it doesn't have anything to grow in like soil, uh, it actually parasitizes or it grows this little specialized root that penetrates into the tree. And that's where it grows. So that's how it collects its nutrients. Um, and that's how it is able to survive because it's in the air. Um, most people are used to seeing mistletoe, maybe you see it at Christmas or like in the doorways or the hallways. Uh, but the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, I've seen this everywhere. So it actually looks like this. Maybe you've seen it before in a tree, you thought it was a bird's nest, but these are actually mistletoes that have been, you know, wiped away by birds and that are now growing in trees. So uh, that is what I study. Uh, my research focuses on uh, the hostorium, so that's this little root that grows out of that little seed, and it penetrates into other plants. So this is, uh, I believe it's called Indian paintbrush or Castilea indivisa, and that you wouldn't even know that this beautiful gorgeous flower is actually parasitizing to stay alive. Uh, and this is when we uh, turn it into a, a microscope picture, right? When we uh, put it under the microscope, this is what it looks like. So this top part here is the parasite and you can actually see where it's connecting and penetrating into the plant. And this is how it survives to get like nutrients, like sugars that plants need to survive in water. Um, my research focused on sort of how do the parasite seeds find the plant, uh, which is really interesting because when we think about plants, we just kind of think that they do their thing. Um, we know about birds and, you know, animals, they, they, they hunt and they look and they forage uh, for their food, but it, it's really interesting when we think about it with plants. So we focused on whether plants could, if these seedlings could see, so we covered them with this like Kind of like a tutu material to see if they were like sensing light. Um, we then wanted to know are they tasting the plant? So we put it on directly on the plant and then we put it on these like little uh, plastic bottle pieces to see if they were like if they would like try to form a root there. 
And then what was really interesting is we tried to see if plants can smell. Do, sp do plants smell each other? Which is really weird. Uh, and what we learned is that when we put them on the dead plant, so this little seedling here is actually glued to a dead plant, but across from it is a, an alive plant. So what happened is the seedling was actually trying to grow towards the alive plant. So there we were starting to see that, oh, they're trying to smell something. So we either did even further research. This is basically what science is about. You find things and you just keep trying to find out more. So we put them in these little containers. These are Petri dishes, if you've ever seen them before. And in the Petri dish, we said, okay, what if we put one smell on one side and one smell on another side? to see if the little radical, which you see, it kind of looks like a little turtle, um, that little green uh, thing growing out of it, that's actually the root. So it's, I, if you see it, you actually see it kind of going towards the right side. So it was pr showing preference in its type of smell. So it's kind of like if your parents are like, oh, do you want apples or bananas? And you're kind of like, I actually want apples today. <laughs> so that is, is what you see here. And these are just the, we use pipe cleaners. So those are like just your everyday crafts material to hold those different chemicals that had different smells. So uh, this is not, uh, this may feel like really kind of weird. And I've got like some diagrams and numbers here, but basically what we did where we measured how far away the root was growing from a smell. So this one, uh, the smell was pinene, and basically it was trying to grow away from the pinene. Did not like that smell. It grew so long because it was like, oh, that's stinky. Don't want that. And and this one kind of grew towards the limonene, right? So it 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 was kind of like uh, indecisive. And then this, the last one at the bottom here, actually formed what we call that historium, and that's the attachment that our parasitic plants make. Once they're like, yep, I got what I want. Now I can start to take out nutrients and water. So that's the kind of research that I do. Um, but mostly I'm a teacher. So I like to just make really funny plant jokes about the biggest flower in the world and the Pokemon representation for that vial plume. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, Sorry, my cat is like, is screaming right now. You're okay. I'm just going to pretend that he's not doing that. Um, that is so cool. Uh, I, okay, so I, I lived in Germany for a very brief spell and I always saw those balls and we just called them tree balls. I didn't know it was, mistletoe, you've blown my mind completely. Um, <laughs> so everybody in the audience, please send your questions in now. We are ready for them. Um, so we've got a, a question from uh, Peng Fei. Uh, live trees and dead trees have different chemicals. How did you decide which chemicals to put in to attract or uh, detract, I guess, the plants? That's a really great question. So a lot of science is about research and reading people's papers. So there was a study uh, at another school that basically had, they were actually working with a completely different parasitic plant. And they noticed that uh, if they put this plant in sort of like a maze, that the plant would sort of grow towards certain type of chem volatile, we call them uh, volatile chemicals that trees emit. So we took some of their chemicals that they had already studied, and then we tried them with our plant to see if there was any sort of difference. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically how we kind of got the idea of using those volatiles. And then we, we applied it to our own study. Cool. So like if I were to chop down, let's say a uh, cedar tree and bring it in, when I sniff it, it still smells like cedar. So are, did you have to identify smells that only are produced in the living plant material? Yes. Yeah, so the smells that we got were actually from a tomato plant. Oh, cool. So there was the, the pinene, limonene, um, felandrine. Those are all smells that tomatoes usually actually produce. Um, and I think the idea here is that there are absolutely different smells that dead and alive plants make. And we, we wanted to sort of like try to get towards more of those like alive plants. Cause we have the feeling that maybe it's not even if it's choosing dead or alive, but it's actually choosing what types of trees it wants to grow on. Maybe certain trees give better nutrients or, you know, provide better, uh, areas for light and growth. So um, that's, that's where my part of the project stopped. Uh, but yeah, I definitely want to get into those differences between dead and alive trees uh, and what kind of chemicals they're emitting. Awesome. Um, 
are some species of trees like really attractive to mistletoes? And if so, like which ones do, does mistletoe really like? Yeah, for the most part, I think it's really interesting, right? It's wherever the bird stops <laughs> and then wherever the plant decides to grow. So um, it, mostly where we did our work in Texas, uh, they were growing on white, uh, uh, on river oak, black oaks, river oaks, white oaks, those sort of trees, because I think those are most prevalent in the area. Um, but I do think they can mostly, they're not too preferential if they, you know, if they're there, if they, if right. they find a host. I, I still can't believe that birds are wiping their butts on trees. I just did not. I didn't. I never knew that. I don't know what I thought they did. Just projectiled it out their butt. So I'm yeah. really glad I know that now. Um, uh, the next question is, should parasitic plants be removed or controlled? That's a great question. So I actually focused my master's on uh, at Columbia University. I, I was focusing on this endangered and rare parasitic plant. And people were like, why do we care about parasitic plants, right? You know, they just, they, uh, they, they actually can be really cumbersome. They can uh, wipe out lots of really big crops like tomatoes and wheat and sorghum. And we absolutely don't want that to happen. But there are lots of parasitic plants that help uh, root, like keep other plants in line. So what I call them are they're the bouncer of plants, right? Like they don't let other plants get too out of control. So up here in New Jersey, uh, we have lots of grasses that grow uh, because uh, our trees have been cut down in certain areas. And what we prefer to happen is for there to be, um, if we have some older students in the crowd, you probably know about the secession of trees in, uh, out in ecology, right? We, we have our grasses and then eventually we get understory trees and bushes and then we get larger trees. Well, if the grasses outcompete everything, nothing can grow. So sometimes our parasitic plants parasitize those and they allow, to, they reduce the amount of those sorts of plants. So other other things can grow, which is really great. So they're kind of, they kind of keep things in check in terms of that. Um, and a, another thing that they're really great at is sometimes if a parasitic plant is present, that means that other uh, organisms might be present, right? Certain birds uh, that disperse those fruits or certain animals that, that eat those plants. And that's a good sign. We always, uh, sometimes if you remove things out of the, the the spider web of, of nature, right? Things start to collapse in other ways, so. Yeah, every member of the ecosystem is important, even if we don't notice um, from our like understanding of, of science. Awesome. Absolutely. Um, Beth would like to know, where in the world does mistletoe grow? across the street from my parents' house, apparently. <laughs> my neighbor, once I realized what Paris, uh, what, what mistletoe was, I was like, there it is. So now you all have like the x-ray vision to find it. It, it pretty much grows everywhere. Um, mostly on trees uh, is where you're gonna find it. You won't find it on like bushes or, or small plants. Uh, it parasites things in, in the air. So basically trees. Uh, so you'll find it in forests or backyards or wherever birds may carry their, their will. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, Madison wants to know, do corpse flowers need a specific climate to live in? Yes, corpse flowers, which are really cool. Oh, cool. Um, uh, let, let's see, I probably can, I like to pull things up so people know what other folks are talking about. Yes. So corpse flowers are real, it, it's this uh, plant called um, the Titan Arum. You usually only find it in uh, places like botanical gardens. And that's because it requires a very certain type of climate. So let me, this is what it looks like. <laughs> uh, it's really big. This guy's holding his child over it. Um, <laughs> and what happens is it's, it also, it's really smelly. So that's why they call it a corpse flower. There we go. That's a good one. Um, it does need a really good climate. So like really warm, humid, um, not easy to grow in say where I live up in the Northeast. <laughs> Super cool. So that flower and also the, the um, I forget the Pokemon name. I know you just said it. Oh, Vileplume. <laughs> yeah. So are, how similar are those two? Are, they're not the same plant, right? They're a different plant? Definitely different plants. Although, um, you know, they have very magnificent features because they're just yeah. really huge, right. um, which is really interesting. They have, uh, I would say, similar environments because you need a lot of room to grow, yeah. you need a lot of energy to grow, which means you're probably gonna need a lot of sunlight, good amount of water. Um, and 
probably need to live somewhere where other people aren't likely to pick you. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably going to live in some sort of like forest or uh, isolated areas. So uh, those are, are very similar in that sort of feature. They both smell like uh, like dead meat. <laughs> so yeah. they're, they're similar in that sense, which means that they're probably pollinated by uh, animals and flies. Right. Cool. Gross. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Um, is there a way that we can help endangered parasitic plants? That's a good question. I think, uh, you know, our goal should always be to, to help all endangered species and organisms. And even though we can't, we might not be able to specifically help a certain plant. I think the way that we, we go about nature is a really great way to protect a lot of species, right? So making sure that we're really careful about where we step Try not to go off paths if you ever go on a hike, because um, you might be crushing something that that could be really special and really rare. Um, making sure that you're not picking plants uh, if you're not allowed to or don't have a professional with you or an expert, um, because sometimes we, we find flowers and we're like, oh, it's so pretty, I wanna pick it and take it home. But what we do is when we take the flower, we take away its ability to reproduce. So that is definitely a way that we can protect all um, uh, endangered and rare species. Very good advice. Um, the next uh, question is, we are doing science fair right now. In your experiments, how did you eliminate variables? <laughs> That's a really great question. A good question. So um, eliminating variables, uh, it really, you have to think about how complex your question is and then really try to simplify it. This is something I work with my students all the time. They always have these really great and big ideas and I'm like, wait, 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 okay, let's roll it back what is the like the most important question that you want out of here? And then we sort of identify what are all the potential variables that can kind of mess up getting to our answer. Um, you know, a, a lot of students are really interested in things, especially with humans. And I say, well, you know, if you're recording data day to day, <laughs> how might you change day to day? Maybe, you know, how much sleep you get or how much food you eat or, uh, you know, how much stress you have from a test that's coming up or another project. Right. So thinking about uh, eliminating variables, think about all the potential ways that you can run into obstacles and then try to uh, remove that way. I think that's a really good way to start. Awesome. Um, this is from Mrs. Young's fourth and fifth grade class. Aya would like to know for these scent experiments, is there a particular chemical that the seeds are attracted to? Does it have to do with the seeds ability to discern where the best place to grow is? That's a great question. I'm sure it's not just uh, the smell, right? It might be the amount of light that it's getting to. Or, or whether you know it's partially hanging off a branch or not. Uh, but it seems like uh, the smells that it was most attracted to were uh, things that were not pine related. Um, and that was really interesting because that was the one where it, it really went oh, the wrong, like the different way when it smelled the pine scent. And that's really interesting because you usually don't see, I don't think I've ever seen a mistletoe parasitize a pine tree. So, um, and that could be because of the sap, right? And it gets really sticky and it's very strong. I don't know if you've ever gotten pine sap on you, but it is awful. Yeah. <laughs> You're just like, please come off of me. Um, so it, it could be like maybe uh, things like that. And that pine sap is usually like an insecticide, right? It's trying to protect that tree. So maybe um, it, it's some sort of evolutionary, like, oh, if this scent is related to uh, a fungicide or insecticide made by plants normally, maybe they know not to parasitize that. Don't waste your time. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, when I was six, I was out in California for the first time and uh, visiting family and I saw pine sap coming out of a tree and I, I was six. Okay. I thought it was maple syrup because I knew that maple syrup came from, came from somewhere. <laughs> so I licked it. It was I mean, the gro it's one of my first memories. It's the grossest thing I've ever done. It's, it, I mean, I couldn't get that taste out of my mouth. To, so I don't blame these mistletoe. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't want to live in a pine tree either. They smell great, but oh my God. Um, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> I'm scarred. I'm still scarred at 31. Um, okay. So the next question is, are certain types of mushrooms parasitic plants? And that's from Dexter and Milo. Thanks, Dexter and Milo. Um, so actually, here, I'm going to blow your mind really quick. Fungi are actually more closely related to animals than they are to plants. So they're actually in their own little family. 
Um, fungi actually are, are in mushrooms. They're not related to plants. They're not closely related to plants, although they seem like they kind of do the same thing, right? They, they grow everywhere and uh, they, they, you know, help, uh, you know, nutrient, uh, provide nutrients to the soil, but they're actually not very similar. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's my answer to that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're their own thing. It's wild. Um, Ellie wants to know, are weeds parasitic? Great question. Um, well, it depends on who's calling it a weed. Uh, if we're talking to my mom, who's a gardener, <laughs> she would be like, weeds are everywhere. They're parasitic. And I would be like, no way, mom. Really, weeds yeah. are actually just usually what people don't want in their gardens. <laughs> and, and weeds are, they're not parasitic. They just are really good at growing in different places. So especially like if you ever go on a walk in like a neighborhood and in the cracks of the sidewalks, you'll sometimes see plants like thriving there. And it's just because they're really good at growing. <laughs> and sometimes it's because birds, again, birds here uh, are just dropping seeds wherever they go or, you know, pooping seeds everywhere they go and they just happen to, to get there and then they grow. Yeah, awesome. Um, so this is a sort of related question. Kudzu is everywhere in the South. Is that considered parasitic or is it just another one of these examples of plants that do really well uh, everywhere? Yeah, that's a great question. So kudzu is not um, parasitic. And here I'll show you, if you're from the Southeast, you're probably really familiar with it because you've seen it everywhere. Um, I did a road trip to, to like through Georgia and it was just, uh, it was just everywhere. Um, so this is, could do. And you'll see that it just kind of grows rampantly. It just kind of takes over everywhere. So it's actually an invasive species. And here, I'll put that up there. Um, it's an invasive species, so it's not parasitic. Uh, it just grows really well in where, like in the place that it, it currently exists. Uh, it's not native to the United States. Uh, it was brought over, uh, uh, I believe, I actually don't remember exactly when it was brought over, but it was brought over like from outside of the country. And sometimes when that happens, uh, uh, we have to be really careful because it this plant is not only just growing really well, it's also taking away space for native plants to grow. Um, so it, it, it's not, in, it's invasive in a way that it's like really nox, uh, noxious is what we would call it. And this is what we actually should refer to as a weed because <laughs> it's not where we want it to be and it's taking over the place and, and, you know, it's really hard to, to truly remove it. Right. Thanks. Um, Sylvia wants to know how are plants smelling these scents? They don't have noses. How are they doing it? Brandy, I'll come back. Just frozen for a second. Can you hear us, Brandy? Aha, uh -huh, there you are. Sorry, you, you froze uh, and we didn't get any of that answer. I'm sorry. Oh, darn. Now I can hear you. Oh, gosh. Liz, I also, uh, you asked the question, why don't birds wipe their butts on leaves? I bet they do in the process of wiping it on the branches. Uh, I bet they don't like pick up the leaf because they don't have hands, I bet. That's probably, that's probably what that's about. It's the biggest plant in the world. Yeah, I think it's a bad connection. Um, but Brandy will be back. We just got to hang tight. Oh, I, I believe you're here, Brandy. Well, in the meantime, while we're waiting for Brandy, um, would you like to see a leaf insect? Because I just got leaf insects in. So I'm just going to show you that, uh, while we're hanging tight here, I'll go grab them. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, I'm on my phone. <laughs> oh, whatever works. Okay, so 
Sorry, I'm I'm um grabbing insects from the other side of the room. But go ahead and answer whatever that last question was that we asked. I can't remember. Um, I believe. Oh, and you got to give me a uh, privilege to turn my video on again. Oh, you betcha. You betcha. <laughs> Here I come. Here I come. Hmm. Do, do, do. do you know what your name is on? Uh, yeah, it should be the same. Oh, you know, just our, our average technical difficulties. It, <laughs> it's, it's also uh, like storming in New York City, so. <laughs> I know. Um, That's okay if you can't see me, I can still answer questions. Uh, oh, okay, here we go. How about that? Let's try that. Oh, hi, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, so I think the last question was about Oh, how do plants smell or how do we know that they yeah. smell things? So that's a really good question. I actually don't know how to answer it. Um, it it's definitely, it has to do with, uh, you know, some sort of senses within, I think it's like just detecting chemicals uh, rather than necessary thinking if they have noses. Um, and it, it really great question. I actually don't know how. It's, it's one of the things we'd have to look into. <laughs> Cool. Um, Mrs. Young's fourth and fifth grade class say, other than leafy mistletoe, do you study and or grow other parasitic plants? Ooh, so I studied this really cute plant. I don't have a picture of it now because it's on my phone, but um, it, it's called Shulbea Americana and it, it's very cute. Um, but it, it is also a mistletoe, uh, sorry, it's also a parasite, but I don't, I don't study any other parasitic plants, but I do grow plants. <laughs> so I'm currently growing. Um, let's see if I can go pull it up. Yeah. We're just gonna, we're gonna go with this since now right. I'm mobile. That's um, right. <laughs> so So I actually have, um, this is a pineapple <laughs> that I'm growing. Uh, You're growing like pineapple? Here. Yeah, I'm growing a pineapple in New York. <laughs> so um, you'll see here actually is, these are the roots. I cut the top of my pineapple off. Um, and then what you're supposed to do, this is like, you could totally do this at home without anyone's help. Or I mean, if you're a kid, you know, get some help with the knife. But so what you do is you take the bottom of the pineapple and you pull off the leaves at the very bottom and then you put it in some water and then you change the water every couple of days and you get roots and then you can pot it and then you can this will eventually start to grow another pineapple so what'll happen is at the very top of this another pineapple will grow so um that is currently what i'm growing i grow strawberries and other plants that I, my cats hopefully won't eat they're really good at eating my plants but um yeah <laughs> so that's what i do that's awesome. I'm I'm totally doing that when the next time I get a pineapple, which is all the time because I love pineapple. Um, awesome. Alyssa would like to know, what do you think the most important thing overall for plants to grow is besides water and sun? Wow, oh, great question. Well, soil, you, you mentioned the top two. The top third one would definitely be soil um, for plants that require it. Um, soil is really important because sometimes you can't just go out and get the dirt in the backyard you kind of have to think about what your plant needs. So some really cool plants and really cool Pokemon um, like Victory Bell and Weeping Bell, those are what we call uh, the, the sun, no, sorry, not the sundew, um, the pitcher plant. So the pitcher plant actually needs very specialized soil because it's used to growing in soil that doesn't have all the nutrients that it needs. So sometimes you have to add a little bit more chemical elements to it so it can grow better. Um, and some plants grow really well in like rocky terrain, right? That has like lots of metals in it. So <laughs> you might need to like specify the type of soil it needs. So soil is like really not just like your standard water and light. It, it can be really complex. For sure, for sure. Um, the next question from Ellie, do plants have nerves or feeling? Plants don't have nerves, um, but when you say feelings, do you mean, are, do, they, are, do they have emotions or do they have responses? Because the answer to the, that question is they definitely have a, uh, a response to things. So there's a really cool plant called the touch me not. Um, and you can Google it if you'd like later, but when you touch it, 
right? And this is, some people would consider this a weed, uh, but if you touch it, what happens is the, the leaves, they close up immediately, um, which is really cute and adorable, but also um, really cool. <laughs> so they respond in that way. And then if you've ever seen the Venus flytrap, you know that that, uh, it has like the two like uh, leaves that close whenever a fly comes into it. So it closes when it senses that response. Some plants curl up their leaves, some, you know, and, and uh, flowers move with the sunlight. Like there's lots of ways that I think plants are really more alive than we think they are. For sure. Yeah. Um, the next question is, what is your favorite parasitic plant? Oh, my favorite parasitic plant. I think it would have to be the one I showed you earlier, um, uh, the Castilea indivisa or the Indian paintbrush. Uh, which has a not great name, but really gorgeous flower. Um, it's like bright pink and it's one of my favorites because in Texas during wildflower season, which is coming up really soon, um, you see it everywhere <laughs> and you see like the blue bonnets in between, but it's just like this really gorgeous flower. Awesome. Um, what is the biggest plant in the world from Liz? Oh, that's the one I showed you earlier. So that's actually a Rafflesia or Vile Bloom for my Pokemon stands. So <laughs> that one is the biggest flower in the world uh, in terms of uh, how big the flower is. But I'll tell you the largest organism in the world. And when I, I mean like organism, I mean like bigger than whales. And that is actually the, uh, the popular tree. So in Colorado, uh, through a couple of other states, I believe, there's like one plant and it's connected to a bunch of different, same of those plants. Uh, they're called popular trees uh, and they're leaf shake. <laughs> uh, they're called, oh, quaking aspens is what they call it, what they call them, sorry. Um, and the organism is so big that it's bigger than like, I think like 10 whales. Like you could wrap it around the earth. That's just how many trees are connected. They're all the same tree. So it's pretty cool. That is so, so, so cool. Um, let's see. So uh, what is your favorite house plant? And do you have any like suggestions for folks at home that are trying to have a planty life? <laughs> so uh, usually I would say my favorite house plant is whichever one survives the cats. Um, <laughs> but I would say my favorite house plants are the things that help me in the house. So not just the ones that kind of stand there. I mean, granted, the ones that just kind of stand there are really great because they get provide oxygen in your in your house, which are really great. Um, but I really love aloe because I'm an avid cooker. So I like to cook and bake. And sometimes I burn myself. And aloe is really great to put on cuts and burns. So aloe is a really big one. Um, I would say any herb, right? So if you can grow like mint or parsley or any of those things, they just smell wonderful, but also you can put them in your cooking. <laughs> Good advice. Um, this is from Mrs. Young's fourth and fifth grade class. Follow up on Aya's question. Uh, do you th think that the fact that the plants don't like pine means that the pine could have something poisonous in it? Definitely. I definitely think so. And, and, you know, not good for their growth in terms of the plant trying to survive. Because remember, the plant, uh, the mistletoe seedling, it's just a seed, so it's just a baby. So that means that if it needs to make the right choice to survive without it, any sort of help. So if it smells something that it doesn't like, it's almost like a warning sign. Right. Cool. Um, the next question from the same class is, do you enjoy Disney bounding? I admittedly don't know what that means, but maybe you do. <laughs> Disney bounding. Do you mean like, is that like going to I'm Disney? assuming it's related to the Snow White outfit. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> so I, I was, um, that was for Halloween at school. I, I decided to be uh, Snow White and I also was like doing chemistry in it. So yes, that is, that is, I do enjoy cosplay. So I actually enjoy wearing all sorts of costumes. <laughs> that is definitely one of my favorite things to do. That's awesome. Um, cool, cool. Let's see. Uh, this is a tough question. Sally is wondering how fruits grow on trees. Oh, that's a great question. So fruits are one of my favorite things because fruits are really weird. They're so different and unique and they kind of remind me of people because they all just kind of grow in different ways and, and live their lives and they're all delicious in lots of different ways. So the way a fruit grows, right? is basically a flower has to be pollinated. So that flower can be pollinated by ants, bats, birds, bees, 
any of those things. And when that pollen pollinates it, right, this, the seed starts to grow. So the inside of the seed starts to grow. And when that grows, the fruit outside of it grows, right? So your flower ends up, your petals fall off and then the fruit starts to grow more and more until it turns into the fruit that it is. So the same thing happens for trees. So, you know, it, it just depends on where it is. So usually really tiny flowers, get pollinated by things like ants and really big flowers get pollinated by things like birds and bats. Uh, and that's how we, we get our fruit today. Awesome. Thanks. Um, Bea would like to know, are ivies parasitic to a tree when they grow on a tree? That's a great question, Ivy. Um, so actually those are what we call epiphytic plants. So they're not parasitic, but they're epiphytic. And what that means is they just actually grow on trees. So this is this happens if you like live in Louisiana or Georgia or even Florida, you've seen kind of like moss <laughs> and, and ivy kind of like uh, growing on top of trees. They're not parasitizing them. They're actually just kind of hanging out on them, just like you would see like a mom holding a baby. <laughs> right. And uh, when they, they do that, so they can, it, it's really good for them to both be out of danger of being eaten uh, on the ground, but also, it's a great way for them to collect water. Uh, so they're higher up, they collect water, and that water helps them survive. Awesome. Here's a question. How, okay, Spanish moss gets up there, grows, hangs off trees. How does it get up there in the first place? It's all the birds. Birds. <laughs> birds I should have known when things get up in the air it's definitely up it's definitely bird, bird driven. Thing. good to know cool um this is from 678 Saint Isidore uh how does climate change affect plant habitats oh huge absolutely huge so my parents live in Houston and mm -hmm. they are getting slammed by the winter storm this year oh um God. and it, that's really huge because the way my mom decides what goes in her garden is by things that'll survive in her garden, right. right? So it's usually things that are like subtropical, like bougainvilleas and, you know, really pretty plants. Like she doesn't grow anything like, like cherry blossoms, like we do up here or tulips. Right. So what happens is, is when climate change continues, right? We call it climate change, not global warming, just because that can kind of, uh, uh, that can confuse people. Climate change means we get extreme heat, but we also get extreme winters. So right. it's harder to control what you can grow. So even like for my mom's garden, right? It may not be as like sad if she loses, I mean, it's still sad if she loses her hibiscus plants, but it's even worse for people who are growing crops, yeah. right? Because yeah. those crops need very specific temperatures, very specific conditions. And a lot of them aren't used to extreme heat or extreme cold. So when we get that fluctuation because of climate change, it doesn't allow for plants that we need to survive to continue to grow. Right, I hope your family is doing okay. That's really scary. They finally have power today, so we're really yeah. excited. Yeah, I've been texting my my Texas friends as well. It's very, it's a scary week. Yeah. Very scary. Um, okay, here's a question. What is the difference between a parasite and a strangler, like in epiphytes? Oh, that's a great question. So parasites actually tap in to the system of the other plant, right? So that, uh, <laughs> I guess the worst, but probably best example is when a uh, person is pregnant, right? Uh, the fetus uses the, the person that's carrying it to, to feed, right? Like, so that's how it gets its nutrients. That's how it gets all its energy, that kind of thing. But the strangler is just actually, you know, it, it's actually just smothering uh, right? It's not inside. It's not tapped in by a root system. It's actually just like, kind of like pushing that other plant out of the way. Right. Cool. Um, Raji wants to know, do plants sleep like us? Do they have downtime? Yeah. <laughs> some of the, the coolest things that you'll see, um, some people like to take time lapses of their plants during the day, because what you do is if you take a time lapse, you'll notice that your plants will turn towards the sun throughout the day. And then as the sun goes down, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll move a little bit less, but it depends on the plant because there are some plants that actually open at night uh, and they're pollinated by nighttime things like bats and, and moths. So um, that's really interesting because uh, some plants, you know, try to conserve their energy uh, in places that are really hot, right? So they'll be sleep during the, the during the daytime. And then at night when it's much cooler, like in desert areas, uh, they'll open up their flowers so they can they can try to deal with the, 
uh, so they can be open when it's much cooler outside. Awesome. Super cool. So you have been answering questions for us rapid fire for the last 40 <laughs> minutes and we really appreciate it. So we, we try to keep these at 45 minutes. Um, so we have two questions that we always ask everybody at the end. The first question is if you could tell everybody in the whole world, you have the whole world's attention, you can tell them one thing about plants, what do you tell them? If I could tell everyone one thing about plants, it would probably be that plants are part of your everyday life and there's no way you can get around them <laughs> and you should really try to learn a little bit more about them because we need them we use them for everything our clothes our toothpaste what we eat uh, how we sleep better uh, so we should really take better care of them so learn about the plants around you you don't even have to like do a deep dive into like you know research but you could just be like hey what are all those spices in my kitchen about and where do they come from and what's their story awesome um thank you and the second question is you could tell everybody in the world anything about anything um it can be as big picture important or silly insignificant as you'd like what do you tell them listen to scientists <laughs> that would probably be mine um i just the, the, there's been a lot of frustration in the world and and it seems like if everyone were to you know you know what I'm not going to say just listen to scientists. I'm going to say have a conversation with the scientists. I actually prefer that instead because uh, just listening sometimes isn't really helpful. But if you have a conversation with someone, you're more likely to listen, but also share your own experiences. And I think that's really important, right? Because scientists need to listen too. We have to listen to each other and we have to listen to the people who are making decisions about science. I Co-sign, completely agree. <laughs> That's literally uh, why I this program exists. So thank you. Um, is there anything that you'd like to plug? Anything you'd like people to know about? Um, where and where can we find you on social media or elsewhere? Oh, great question. Um, you could find me on Instagram or Twitter um, at Stumped Grad. I, I believe uh, I, I was tweeted. Skype the scientist tweeted me out, so you can find me there. Um, and let's see, one thing I, I could plug, um, if you have a bad science experience, experience, right? Like if you, oh my God, that's so cute. Is that a praying mantis? Uh, we'll talk about it at the end. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry, I get so distracted by science things. Same. If, if you have a bad science experience, that means like if you fail a test, or your project didn't go the way you want it to, or maybe you're not having a great time with your teacher, keep trying, right? Because sometimes failure and obstacles or make it they they provide different um scenarios for you in the future so sometimes it's not great but if you persevere sometimes you get to find really cool things later on so always keep trying never give up and always keep moving forward that's that's beautiful that's great um yeah Science and failure, uh, it happens a lot and everybody experiences it. And no scientist that you've ever met hasn't failed. Um, it's just part of it. So thank it's you for part that. Of it. Um, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I'll, I'll show you this little uh, bug now. So um, I, I live in Philadelphia and I'm preparing for the summer for like a bug zoo that we're gonna host a, through Skype a scientist being in real life. Um, and in order, we're doing mostly local species for that bug zoo but I've never kept bugs before. I've done squid, I've done reptiles, I've done cats, you know, but I don't know what I'm doing. And so I went online and like looked for some insects that I could have in the house to kind of um, work on. And this is one of them. So this is a leaf insect. Leaf they insect. They're so silly and cute. They're from the Philippines. Um, and, and scientists grow them in lab. This was not like collected from the Philippines. This was just grown, um, by somebody in the United States. And so, uh, this little animal will get bigger. I have no idea if it's a male or female. I will eventually be able to tell, but this one is, um, is like a youth. It's a young one. Um, and so it eats bramble. So like blackberry and, uh, raspberry, that kind of bush. Um, and they also can eat roses. Um, so I have a bunch of plants in here ready to feed this little, this little monster. And then I also have ghost mantises as well. Oh, um, that's so super cool. <laughs> let's go, let's go grab them. <laughs> they're all for education. This is what they're for. Everything's for education. <laughs>
is- at least that's what I say about everything that I get that I'm like, ooh, new science thing. <laughs> I, I completely agree. Um, and if you have to leave everyone in the audience, we understand. Um, okay, how am I going to do this without making an absolute mess? Okay, you get back in there, you flip upside down, and I have flies all over my desk, but it's cool. Where'd it go? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't actually pick it up. Okay, okay. We're good, we're good. Come here, you. Oh, your leaf insect's just chilling. <laughs> Very uh, calm. Tell me about it. So now I have two insects. Uh, I can't let them get too, too close to each other because I don't know what'll happen. But yeah, this is a ghost mantis, also a baby. Um, not very old. I'm trying to get it to like focus um, on the mantis. Let me try. Anyway, basically I'm, I'm going to be using these for, for education this summer. Um, but yeah, super, super, super cool. Don't know uh, where they're from. I'll figure that out um, to tell you all next week, but very, very fun. And these, um, I feed fruit flies, super easy. Um, and I just need to keep, you know, their humidity right and everything. Um, mm -hmm. but you have mantises as pets. Um, they live less than a year. Um, so not a super long commitment. Um, so if teachers, if you're looking for a fun classroom pet, these are not hard. Um, you just have to make sure that you're getting them from someone who uh, is breeding them in a in like a lab or, or, or a facility and not getting them from the bringing lab. them in yeah yeah um, reputable source <laughs> that's right. exactly exactly so anyway that's what i'm up to over here um everybody at home we hope to see you at the next session thank you for uh sticking with us to this little uh bug experiment at the end here and brandy again thank you for thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today i'm really grateful uh of course and yeah happy black history month too before we uh wrap it up do you want to tell them about um Black Botanists Week? Oh yeah, Black Botanists Week. Uh, so last summer when uh, I believe the black birders started like a, hey, let's identify and let's find more birders who were just like us. Uh, we started Black Botanists Week last summer and it was amazing right. because I probably only know like two black botanists before that event. <laughs> now I know so many, um, which is really great. So it's, it's really about like making connections and finding people who look like you, who also enjoy the same things you do uh, and then em empowering us through that. So uh, if it's uh, black, if you search black botanist week, you'll get a lot of Google search, uh, Google hits, but uh, definitely a reason to, to bring more people of color into, into science spaces. And I, I really enjoyed it. But awesome. yeah, awesome. well, thank, thank you so much. much for having me. I, I love talking about plants. Anytime I get a chance, I'm, I'm here for it. I have to go teach my own class. So, <laughs> okay, well, sounds but good. I'll talk to you thank all you soon. Bye. Right. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Erin, for signing. We really appreciate it. Bye.